Welcome to Android Dialogues, where we have bite-sized conversations with people from the Android community. I'm Chuki Chen, and today we are speaking with Mike Nakimovich. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Uh, where are you based, and what do you do? Um, I'm based in New Jersey, in Jersey City, and I work as an Android engineer for the New York Times. Great. And how do you get started on Android? So I got started because I used to. Um, I worked somewhere that was making a lot of uh, warehouse uh, software. Okay. So before they would make uh, uh, kiosks that would be web connected, mm -hmm. and eventually we wanted to close the loop that drivers on the road can also start using apps. And it ended up in the road. You don't really always have good network connectivity. Um, we wanted to go native, so I made the plunge into doing Android development and kind of never looked back. Nice. So. I actually know Mike because he came to Denver to give a talk at 360 NDEV on Dagger, which is where I really get started to know about scopes and the more advanced feature for Dagger. And we talked a little bit before the interview, and Mike told me that there's even more new stuff coming up that is kind of trying to make Dagger more memory efficient and try to minimize the number of in new instances you have to make. So can you tell us more about that? Um, sure. So I was um, I was lucky enough to be at a talk at a square in New York um, a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. and a couple of members from the Dagger team at Google were there. Uh, Ron Shapiro and oh, I apologize, I can't remember the other name. Okay. But uh, yeah, they talked about uh, basically what they're doing with Dagger too, and it seems like. One of the reasons why Google took over Dagger from Square was because they're able to just have a lot more resources on the project. Mm. So where this was just a library at Square, they have a team for it at Google. And once you have a team for something, you can not only make it work, you can actually make it fast and make it efficient and do all of the other things that we as Android developers uh, want our libraries to have. So a few things that came out of that talk was um, optimizations that the Dagger team is starting to do to uh, make Dagger more performant. Uh, some of my favorite ones that came out of it were uh, there's, there's a new annotation that we can, we can use which will now allow us to uh, set flags of when, these, uh, when our objects should be destroyed. So for example, uh, using this reusable annotation, we can now say we want to trim one of our components when memory is low, which is really nice because a lot of people have Android applications that have singletons, and these singletons are alive forever, and they keep making more and more singletons, and you know, eventually on an embedded system like Android, it starts really bogging us down. So that was really nice to hear about, and uh, the, other, the other aspect of what they're trying to do is to keep, um, to have instances not blow out of control. So we all know that Dagger makes factories and allows us to inject things, and it's generating code. But unfortunately, the way that Dagger works right now is that it's making lots and lots of little instances. It has to make a provider for each one of your provides methods. There's member injectors in there as well. And they're trying to have some of that uh, not be necessary. So one of the steps that the Dagger is going towards is allowing you to use static provides methods within your modules. So right now, we have to make an instance of a module to then make instances of all of our provides methods, and that's a lot of instances. With new versions of Dagger, you're going to be able to have static provides methods, so Dagger can hook directly into your static methods without having to make an instance of those providers. So that should really help apps that um, manage lots and lots of objects and yeah. have this large uh, startup cost. Uh, to give you an example, I mean, in the New York Times app, we are mm -hmm. hitting over 100 milliseconds of graph validation when it starts, and we're very excited wow. to start going the And that's direction. Dagger 2 already, right? That's Dagger 2 Because Dagger 1, I mean, for people who are mm -hmm. not familiar with that, Dagger 2 already have a lot of optimization. For example, they don't do reflection anymore. Everything yep. is pre-compiled generated. Um, so for the static, Static injectors? Static, what, uh, static, static, what? Pro <laughs> static uh, provides methods. Okay. So is there any reason why I would not do that? Because right now, I do it with no, non-static, because that's the only way. Sure. So there are, for most cases, you will be able to use static provides methods. Right. The only times you cannot uh, use a static provides is if you'd like to pass an instance into your module. So a very common example in Android is either passing your application instance to your app module, okay. or passing an activity instance to your activity module so that you can later inject it. Because you're passing in an instance, you'll need an instance of right. the provides. So you have to actually create an instance. Yes. 
So, but at least the modules that, like, uh, most applications have multiple modules. And even though you may have an app module, you may also have a network module and a right. library module. And those, those can now be these static modules with static nice. provides methods that don't have to be instantiated. So now you kind of flip the situation, basically. It's like everything should be static unless otherwise. Exactly. So rather than now, it's like everything is just instances. Yep. Cool. Precisely. So I actually, once you are talking about injecting activity, I just realized that there's something that I wanted to ask you about, which is scopes. Because I, so far, the way I've been using Dagger is I have an activity, not activity, a, a, a application level uh, component, which I just have this one entity that everybody stick their hand into and right. we're like, hey, provide me a clock. Okay, here you have a clock. Um, so I know that Dagger 2, it's not new, Dagger 2 already has it, they have scopes. And I just kind of want to understand how do you use scopes, what are you good for and why? I can't just have this God component that sure. just provides everything. Yep. So you can have a God component mm -hmm. and you can make singletons that your whole application will use in those application components. But what you're unable to do mm -hmm. is to make, to share objects, not with the whole application, but with a smaller scope. So one very common pattern in Android is to have an activity scope so that you will be able to, the same way that you can have a singleton for your whole application, you can have what I like to call activity scope singletons or some kind of scope singletons. And to kind of take a step back, when, when I say singleton, Java has an annotation called singleton, which is just a scope annotation. So that is one that was built into a... Uh, into what does the, that even do? Because I, I do that when I make uh, the, the modules in mm -hmm. Dagger. I'm like, everybody's a singleton. Because the reason why is that I need to swap them in for testing. So during tests, I will muck with the state of the singleton so that the app will also use the same state. So everything is a singleton. Sure. So like, does the word singleton change anything, I mean, it's an annotation, right? So I have to have, an an yeah. I have to have an annotation processor, which Dagger is mm -hmm. doing. Um, so, so I use that to signify Dagger to do something different? You're, you're using it to, s you add your scope annotation, singleton in this case, to mm -hmm. a particular component, which then makes a contract that any provides method that also has this annotation will be one per that component. Okay. So in your case, you only have one component, right? right. So you put your singleton annotation on that component, mm -hmm. and then in any module that is on that component, you can mark those, you can mark those provides methods as singleton, or right. once per that component or that graph. Right. Now, if you want to actually have additional scopes, and mm -hmm. this is very similar if people have done a web development that you have a request scope or a session scope, you almost have um, object graphs that live and die, not when your whole application lives and dies, but when something smaller lives and dies. So the very common example that I was getting at was uh, an activity scope. Mm -hmm. And what's really nice about Dagger is that rather than just having the big scope for your whole application, you can have a subcomponent sub subcomponent that has its own scope as well. Now, what we use that at New York Times for is to have what we call activity singletons. So some nice ones are, say you have an activity that has three or four different fragments. Okay. So one might be a drawer, others can be a top pane, a bottom pane, and you may want to share some objects like a view model or a presenter okay. with all of those different views. But you don't want to just have the activity retain it and have to pass it to each one of those views. Dagger lets you set up a subcomponent that would be scoped to an activity that you can then mark this is an activity scoped object. I want one per activity, yeah. one for this scope. So I'm just kind of trying to wrap my head against it. So say I don't have dagger, what I would have done it probably is in the activity, I will have a function that says get instance, exactly. whatever, and then it will stash it away. And then every, um, well, I guess you will have to cast it. So you have to get right. activity and then cast into the specific type of activity, then they say, Hey, give me that thing. So when everybody asks for it, it will be the same exact object because the activity is holding it as, an, as a uh, singleton. Right, exactly. But once I'm out of this activity, if the, the, the part when it falls apart is that if I have the same 
uh, fragment and I use it in a different activity, then I can't do that anymore because I have to cast it to the specific. Yep. So for example, like I have to cast it to, I, I, I don't know, calculation activity or something like yeah. that. If, I, if the, the fragment I want to reuse that, then I cannot grab that particular instance. Right. But if we set it up as an activity scope, then I could potentially set up another activity that provides also an instance. Yep, exactly. You're absolutely right. Okay. And uh, the other areas where it's really nice, so one of the tricks that we're able to do at New York Times with this is that we could inject intent values that are being passed into an activity into fragments and sub-fragments. Mm -hmm. So rather than having to use fragment args and passing it from one activity to another, from that activity to its fragment, from that fragment to another fragment, mm -hmm. you could instead just inject it only to that second fragment where you need it rather than having to do all of these pass-through uh, dependencies. The other area that we just, um, so we just came up with, a th we just came out with a 360 video implementation at work, and that was a little complicated for us because it was actually building video controls. So even though Google was providing us with a GVR view which can play 360 videos, if we wanted to have control overlays over it, well, that's another view or another fragment right. that we're putting on top of it. Mm -hmm. So it was really nice for us to make a VR state object that is activity scoped and be able to inject it into both the view that is showing the video and the controls and use that as the bridge between the two. Cool. All right. So one final question. So now I have a much better understanding of why we're doing it. So essentially, it's like a... It's like the com God component that I have, except it's, in, it's only to village. It's exactly. like this thing doesn't go outside. Yeah. It's how, like packaged local, basically. Right. Yeah. So how do you test that? Because when I test my, when I do testing, the, the, the app component, it gets swapped with a test component. And I use the test runner so that the test runner will instantiate a different application. And then that application will instantiate the test component rather than the app component. Sure. So for the activity, how would you do so that? So you actually do it the same exact way. Okay. And the way that Dagger is set up is that your application component has a hook to your activity component. So what I mean by that is you actually export your activity component as though you're exporting some other um, global singleton within your component. Okay. So you can override that activity component the same way that you are overriding your application component. So now, when mm. I build up my um, when I build up my test application and when my test rule or whatever my test application is, yeah, I can still instantiate an application component, mock the modules that are under it, and then mock the modules that are under the activity component. So you're still mm. going to be making you're still going to be using builders, and because you're using builders right. and this is Java, you can override those modules to have ah, different methods inside of that. So I think that. that's the part that I missed. So I didn't realize that you need a subcomponent to go with each scope. Is that how it works? Yes, you'll need a subcomponent, ah. and that subcomponent is where you would put all of the modules that are for that, makes sense. for then, that component. Then when I have yeah. an activity scope, then I will also have a... So basically, it's literally what I just said. Like everything is exactly how it works, except it's in a little village of activity scope. Yep. So instead of having a global component, I have a a, a subcomponent that when I w instead of overriding the global component in my test, I'll override the subcomponent in my test. Precisely, precisely. Oh, yep. And if I'm you so guys, glad I'm talking to yeah. you because I was like reading the document. I don't understand how these scoping things work. That makes so sure. much sense. And since you mentioned it, uh, I did have that talk at uh, 360NDev, right. which was a fabulous, fabulous conference. Yay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for talking for there. Yep. Cool. And uh, it actually goes through some code examples of how to override something on the application, how to override something on the activity. And you know, a lot of it is just using Java concepts of just overriding methods, making a new instance while overriding some of the methods right. that are under it. I think a lot of people are kind of staying away from Dagger a little bit because it sounds complicated, right? All these different concepts of scopes and components and modules and overriding and things like that. But at the end of the day, like you said, if you understand how an object-oriented language works, how things get overridden, you can unwrap that. It's not, it's, once you like have sit down and think it through, it's actually not too bad. So and, and I'm glad that you're giving talks so people can, um, and we'll definitely link to your 360 and sure, Dev talk you. so people can get further. So Mike, thank you so much for uh, talking with us. And if people want to follow up and see what else you do on the internet, where they can find you? 
Um, probably on Twitter, uh, friendly Mikhail. It's, I'm, I'm new to Twitter, but I'm starting to catch some steam. So uh, all right, cool. Definitely so, start a conversation. Yeah, we'll definitely with me. Uh, link that as well, so people can uh, follow you. Wonderful. Great. Thank you so much, awesome. Mike. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye.